investors are looking for an exit and are pushing in some way uh, the shiny object that is America. And yet Bukalapa is convinced that, you know, we're going to stay local and do this uh, for Indonesia. What, what's your view there on, on this approach? I think it's a great thing for Indonesia um, because we know like during the pandemic, uh, our IPO market is not doing so well. So this mm-hmm. could be like a, a boost for this IPO market in Indonesia. And uh, we believe this is going to help invigorate uh, the stock market here in the country. Because last year, um, the four, four, 470 million IPO market was down by 50%. Here. Indonesian startups have been making headlines in the last few years, including most recently the news that online mall Bukalapa is set to raise about 22 trillion Indonesian rupiah or 1.5 billion US dollars in the country's largest ever IPO, setting the stage for a wave of tech listings with fellow unicorns GoTo and Traveloka to follow suit. Home to the region's largest population at 272 million, it's no surprise that Indonesia is in its prime time for entrepreneurs with hyper-local solutions to problems like its largely unbanked population, its underdeveloped internet infrastructure, and so much more. This week, we begin to scratch the surface of the Indonesian startup storyline with veteran digital entrepreneur and evangelist Shinta Danawardoyo. Known fondly as Shinta Bubu, she built her first company, Bubu.com, as a web development agency that today is a holding company of multiple ventures from Bubu Gaming, Startup Indonesia, and LabX Incubator. Over the last 25 years, Shinta has been instrumental in building the Indonesian entrepreneurial ecosystem as an angel investor of VC and the first point of call for any emerging Indonesian startup. You don't want to miss this. Welcome to Villain Dollar Moves, the show for the top US and Asia founders, funders, and execs. From the growing pains of a unicorn journey to IPO, scaling a venture capital firm, and the shift of wealth, we cover it all. Shinta, how are you? Oh my God, Sarah, thank you. I'm so honored to be here with you and thank you for inviting. So I'm so excited. No, of course, of course. You know, I, I think uh, we, we talked about this, you know, we were so deep in, in our work and we actually never had a conversation uh, where we get to talk about life and, and some of the things that we're, you know, uh, passionate about and working hard about, we're, we're just doing, right? Both of us just do, do, do. So I, I'm, lo- I'm loving this opportunity to dive a little bit deep and want to speak a little bit about Indonesia as well, the rise. Uh, and you know a lot of the challenges that people don't see along the way and of course you know you've been veteran uh, for many years now I think it's past two decades right 25 years is that almost this July 25 (laughs) 25 years yeah so let's start from the very beginning Shinta let's talk a little bit about your personal path you know want to get to know about you and and your billion dollar moves and I know uh, you started with being an architect and yes. then shifting over to business to your father's dismay after he bought you a $5,000 Macintosh back in the oh day. God. So, so yeah. start and tell us. Yeah, so um, actually my background has nothing to do with IT. So I'm an architect by study. So my, um, my bachelor degree was in interior architecture. So it's a five years course, it's very long. My master degree, I want to take business. So I want to take my MBA. So my dad was like, what? after five years now you want to do business like why didn't you do that from the beginning so um my dad was challenging me like okay fine you um if you want to do mba you just have to find your own money because i still have three younger brothers who he have to put in school and they all want to take master degrees as well Mm -hmm. so i did find a program it's um like a program where you work at a computer lab Mm -hmm. and they pay for your tuition uh, and they also pay salary, a monthly salary. Yeah, but, but, but Shinta, then how, how, why business suddenly? Why, what was the, apakah dorongannya? What's the inspiration? I think it's, it's always like 
because of my curiosity all the time. Every time I read a magazine or business magazine, I always like find all these terms that I don't understand. And mm. so I think I want to learn more about business and, and the fact that, I don't know, I think I always wanted to become an entrepreneur. I want to have my own business. I think that was mm. like early on, something that um, just struck in my mind, even though my 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 dad was not an entrepreneur, my mom as well. So I don't know where it came from. I guess it's from reading mm, this it's magazine. It's from reading. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. You know, I I had a guest. I don't know if you caught the episode. Was Lin Ku, and yeah. she you know came from uh from the you know ghetto as she calls it of Los Angeles and and grew CXA Group to what it what it is now. But her thinking of you know I want to be an engineer first was because she so happened to be babysitting and saw that this person who had a big house uh, was an engineer. And so yeah. it's, it's, it's that concept of what both of us believe in, right? You, you, you become what you can see. Yeah. And for I, you, I guess it was the books that you were exposed to, yeah, which is very interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so then you, you decided yeah, so, to take that yeah. leap. Yeah, so um, I, I got accepted to become the supervisor of the computer lab which mm. uh, I was so lucky because uh, I had teams who really understand IT, not like me, I didn't understand IT. So I actually learned from them, uh, from, from, from my team at, at the computer lab, how to clean virus. You know. I think that's, that's where my fascination of internet came. And I think the one that blows my mind is website. <laughs> at that time, we call it the WW World Wide Web. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think website at that time was something that is out of this world for me because um, mm. I was able to open the same page as somebody in another country. You know, I, would, I can call my uh, dad like, hey dad, can you look at this website? And he'll see the same thing. And at that time it was something that is mind blowing. So mm. I guess that's where it started. So I said, this media cannot be just something small. One day it's gonna be so huge. I kind of fell in love actually with the internet mm -hmm. and website and all that. So um, because of that, um, I taught myself how to create a website through the internet. So that was like the early days of e-learning. There was no word right. of e-learning, but you were able to actually learn something without asking anyone, just by mm -hmm. researching through the internet. So I think that was the, the start of it all. I mean, that's how I fell in love with the internet. So I went back home uh, to Indonesia um, in 95 and I worked first for a consultant management company. But I remember every time I go back from the office, I would go right in front of my Macintosh and start creating website, uh, my personal website. Um, and after like one and a half years of working for other people, um, I decided to jump in and create my own company, which is to create website for other companies or other people. So that's how it started. Of course, um, it was not easy, but because you know, it was early on, you know, um, 1996, Indonesia was yeah. barely using the internet. And you know, let alone the internet connection, it was dial up. <laughs> I don't know yep. if anyone knows what a dial up e anymore. E we had that in <laughs> Malaysia too. <laughs> exactly. And um, I think it's just that my fascination, how the internet um, breaks boundaries between countries, open up different opportunities for people. Um, so I think that's, that's how it started. I fell in love and I created a website for other people. Although it's not easy, we knock doors, we have to explain what internet is, then we explain what is a website. But mm -hmm. when, you're, you know, when you're passionate about something, you just go for it. And you know, there's yeah. tons of hurdles that we have to go through. Um, people don't understand what I'm doing. But yeah. I think that was the challenge. <laughs> yeah, which which is a very familiar thing, right? You know, and, and I've heard you say say this before that you were uh, you felt you were too early for a lot of things, but it's this vision, right, to be able to spot trends that has you know uh, grown to what it is today. And we want to talk a little bit about Indonesia's yeah. explosion of e-commerce of everything digital um, shortly. But for you, then you know, it, this is a classic story, Indonesian girl, you know learns about the internet, obsesses about it, creates a business around it and convinces people. But talk yeah. to us a little bit about, you know, your, your go to market, right? When you were thinking about acquiring customers, how did you go about it in something that was completely new? 
So the easiest way when you start a business, the first people that you know you ask or you offer your business to is people who knows you already. So you don't start from zero. So my first company, uh, my first client, I mean, is the company that I used to work for because, you know, they know me already. So I just say, hey, you guys need a website. Let, you know, let me build it. And they happen like to say, yes, that it rolls with other companies because, you know, we have a portfolio. Uh, even Bank of Indonesia was our early, early client as well. Although it's not easy, of course, when you knock doors, uh, first day I tell them my company is boo-boo.com, they go like, what is boo-boo? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> then I have to explain to them what internet is, and then I have to explain to them what is a website. So yeah, the challenge is there, but uh, I love challenge. <laughs> right. So, so, so you started with people you knew and you kept going yeah. and asking for help and building a, yeah. a track record and, and kept rolling from there. Yeah. And then you've evolved your business multiple times, right? Over the 20 years. Or, yeah. Talk to us a, a little bit about that. You know, as an entrepreneur, how do you disrupt yourself? How do you know, uh, yeah, we need to do something better here? How, how does the business look like as well? So in 2006, we turned into a digital agency because we see mm -hmm. uh, now the clients understand what a website, but they don't know how to market it, right? So they have a website, but they don't know how to market it. So we have to turn ourselves into a digital agency where we help the client to market whatever brand or whatever product that they have. So 2006, we became one of the first digital agency also in Indonesia. And, you know, we got clients like from Unilever, I remember. So that's how we, we always try to see how we can innovate mm -hmm. and, you know, be creative. I think the word is innovative and creative is needed if you're an entrepreneur. You, and also you have to see what's needed uh, from the market. And you just have to be in time because I'm always too early. But at, at the end of the day, if you want to do business, you have to be on time, in time. So... Yeah, so that's that's what we do. Um, we see the opportunity. We see what the market needs. So in 2006, we turned into a digital agency until 2019, where we decide to we want to transform ourselves to become a venture builder. So now Bubu uh, is a venture builder. We created different ventures under Bubu, uh, which includes gaming, um, which uh, we have a, uh, an esport agency because we believe that gaming is the next thing. Well, it's not the next thing, it's the thing right now. You know, we have 120 million gamers in Indonesia wow. and 50% out of that 120 millions are spenders. So when you play a game, you actually spend, right? So we decided like our clients uh, need to understand about gaming. So we started Google Gaming. And then um, Another venture that we started is StartupIndonesia.co, which is a platform to create startup uh, connection with venture capitals, mentors, angel investors, and all that. Because we're 17,000 islands, and most of the time, the startups that are being invested by venture capital are mostly in Jakarta. So we need to change that. We want to be able to give equal access to everybody in Indonesia to have the same connection to all the venture capital, to the investor, to mentors. So we created this platform where we want to help um, bridge that uh, startups and the investors and the mentors and all the other things that startup needs, all the ecosystem. So we started that in 2019 before the pandemic. And when it's 2020, all the venture capital wants to get in, into our platform because they don't know how to make startup after that. And what makes wow. us happy, 50% of the startup that the venture capital wants to meet are not in Jakarta. So they're mm. from all over Indonesia. So that's that was one of our mission, right? To make sure that startups all over Indonesia can be in this platform and the venture capital looks at them. So yeah, um, that's another venture that we started and we started another one um, called LabX, which is, I think that's one of our newest one, which is a collaborative agency. What do you mean by that? Well, now it's the age of collaboration. Brands collaborate with each other. And this is still mm -hmm. talking about the youth market in Indonesia. Um, so we created an agency where we help one brand to collaborate with another brand to create something new, something fresh, where they can actually uh, cross market each other. So right. uh, for instance, a fashion brand 
with an FMCG brand. Idea is um, is how to to actually uh, support this youth market in Indonesia. So out of all these ventures, we have the startups, we have the gamers, and we have the uh, we call it the youth culture in Indonesia, which includes uh, all the fashion, FMCG, sneakers, and all that. Right, love it. And so it seems like you've narrowed down your focus to the youth market, which I think is very smart, right? I mean, Indonesia is a growing population and, and the youth and the spending power is continuing to increase. Um, they're already, you know, you don't have to convince anyone to get a website anymore, right? It's a totally different, you know, need right now. It's how do you convert, right? How do you convert that yeah. into sales? So as you think about your business, I, I think this is interesting, especially for ecosystem builders like yourself. Yeah. When you're building, how do you think about, um, you know, sort of the capital investment, the, the revenue in your business and, and balancing that? Because uh, especially in nascent economies, as, as was, you know, from where I come from in Malaysia, there was a lot of need to pump in uh, government support in the very beginning. Uh, which means that, you know, in the beginning, you might be very tied to one customer, which is the government. H how do you think about building your business, uh, not just from the startup ecosystem, but as Bubu.com, right? We, with these three different pillars, which are going to be your revenue drivers, which is going to be one that is, uh, you know, a longer term sales cycle, but it's important as well. How do you think about that? So uh, the idea why we're building all the ventures is we know that we can spin off each one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, at the moment, startupindonesia.co is raising fun on its own because it's already making, like it's, it's, it's actually generating revenue and uh, we're talking to a couple of venture capital. So that's the idea. It's like we want to create like a holding company out of Bubu and we have mm -hmm. all these different ventures under it. Um, and, you know, as, as of today, all the ventures are actually revenue generating uh, companies already. So um, yeah, so we, we, that's the idea is to actually to spin off each one of them. Yes. Well, now let's turn to you already started on this, you know, I want to hear your thoughts, you know, having seen Indonesia grow uh, in the last 20 years. Um, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. People don't know it's a, is it 270 million population right now? 272 million. Yes. And 272 are, million. We're a country that is under PR. <laughs> I don't think many mm -hmm. people know about Indonesia, which is, yeah, sometimes it's good. Like, you know, we're still under the radar and then, you know, we'll just surprise people. But um, right. yeah, um, I think it's been fascinating, especially for me because I started super early and I finally see things, you know, taking off, finally. <laughs> it takes quite a while though for Indonesia to form. Where yeah. yeah. Yeah, but today, I mean, I, I was listening to Pak Gita uh, and uh, he was sharing about how I think Indonesia is number nine now. So not bad for, you know, innovation and, and building unicorns, right? And we've heard so much in the news recently with the uh, uh, Raksasa Gotu, with, uh, you know, everything that happened with Bukalapa, the IPO and all that. So talk to us a little bit about, uh, first of all, the e-commerce boom. What is happening right now in Indonesia and, and how, how do, you know, investors abroad that are tuning in come to grasp with uh, how do we think about Indonesia? Is it India? Is it China? Is it, how do we think about it? I think uh, Indonesia being uh, such a young market and also we are mobile first country. So we're 272 million and 50% is below 30 years old. So wow. we're top of all the social media because you know, when you know, the youth love to be on social media. So I think, um, for e-commerce, especially because we're 17,000 islands, definitely we need mm. e-commerce. And right now we're about 40 billion. And I think the uh, the key growth on this is because we have this mi uh, micro, small, medium enterprises, about 60 mm -hmm. million of them here in Indonesia. And believe it or not, 9% um, only are using digital. So. Yeah. The opportunity is there. It's quite big, and uh, out of our that 272 million uh, population, 66 percent are unbanked. So there's mm -hmm. another opportunity for fintech companies, right? So these are these are all the different opportunities uh, for our country, and it's quite exciting, especially you're in tech right now. And like you were saying, um, 
we have all these um, IPOs coming up. Um, maybe let me talk a bit about, we have Bukalapak and Goto, uh, which is combination of Gojek and Tokopedia. So Bukalapak is going to do an IPO soon in August. And we believe that could be like um, one of the biggest IPO that we have in Indonesia because we're tracking about one and a half billion on that one. Yeah. And um, well, right now Bukalapak is the fourth largest e-commerce um, in Indonesia. Um, and so I think that's quite exciting uh, for everyone in Indonesia to have a tech company going IPO. And the yeah, next and one yeah, yeah and before ahead. you go into to go to, I want to talk about Bukalapa. I mean, Bukalapa, yeah. for, for those who don't know, it's it's uh, the direct translation is oh, opening okay. the stores, right? So what Shinta was talking about there with regard to the SMEs, they're essentially those small stalls that you see on the streets. Uh, and many of them, as you would expect, would not be digitized. So Bukalapa, they are thinking of listing in Indonesia. Yeah. End of the year. How does that um, strike you? I mean, you know, there's a lot of news in Southeast Asia, right? Taking a, a little bit of a zoom out here with yeah. Wab uh, and yeah. the SPAC that's going to happen in the US. So it seems like, you know, investors, are, you know, and you're an investor yourself, right? A lot of the investors are looking for an exit and are pushing in some way uh, the shiny object that is America. And yet, Bukalapa is convinced that you know we're going to stay local and do this uh, for Indonesia. What what's your view there on on this approach? I think I think this is a great thing for Indonesia um, because we know like during the pandemic uh, our IPO market is not doing so well. So this mm -hmm. could be like a, a boost for this IPO market in Indonesia, and uh, we believe this is going to help invigorate. Uh, the stock market here in the country. Because last year, um, the four, four, 470 million IPO market was down by 50% here mm -hmm. in the country because of the pandemic, right? So I think this is, this is I think, a great move um, for a company like Bukalapak. And later on, we'll talk about a bit about Goto as well, because you know uh, Goto is a combination of Gojek and Tokopedia, the two uh, unicorns and decacorn, actually, of mm -hmm. the country. Um, and they're doing uh, soon after Bukalapak, they're doing a uh, 2 billion pre IPO funding. So that's mm -hmm. also a huge one. And I think both are thinking how they can actually help the IPO market in Indonesia. So I think this is a good, great news for Indonesia. So yeah. I yeah, know everyone well, is doing SPAC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which, and, and it's interesting, right? I mean, just to see um, how nationalistic the, the startups are. And, and also one could argue, I mean, the flip side is Bukalapa is so localized. It's so localized. Yeah. Can other foreign investors understand it the way that Indonesian investors or those that are investing into Indonesia already uh, can understand it, right? But um, do you think in the future, um, this sets up, I, I mean, there's been news about how this Bukalapa uh, IPO will set up many others. So it's sort of like the first one to, yes, you know, um, uh, get things leveled up. What, what do you think? Yes, I believe this is this is going to be like, um, hopefully, an example for other companies to go into IPOs or maybe later on they can go to a SPAC if they want to. But this is mm -hmm. this is something that is exciting for for the market for Indonesia itself uh, because now we have about eight unicorns in the country, so we yeah. want to see more of those, um, not just yeah. unicorns, backup horns and other. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So yeah, definitely. Um, I'm I'm seeing this something positive, something that can uh, trigger a lot of excitement in the digital space for our digital economy. Yeah. And are you concerned at all? I mean, you know, part of the discussion, you know, Grab's um, SPAC deal was pushed uh, by one quarter, and and the news on the ground uh, by the, by the great minds that uh, there's a lot that needs to be done to really be. Um, public ready, right, for the market, yeah. and a lot of fundamentals needs to be addressed. Are you concerned at all about the fundamentals of, um, and, and let's talk a little bit about go, go to Bukalapa, what, what are you seeing there in terms of how they've built and how close they are to be really market ready? I think a company like uh, Goto, because they have to join and combine two companies, I think it'll take time for them to actually be ready because you know restructuring is needed, right? Uh, all these human resources and and how to combine their businesses because you know one is an e-commerce 
platform. The other one is more like a ride hailing slash payment. So uh, there might be some overlap. So that's that's probably needs time to actually mm -hmm. uh, combine the company and be market ready. So yeah, um, I think the, that's the concern. I guess you have to overcome. Like if you're saying that you're ready for IPO, you just have to do it, I guess. And this is supposed to be a positive and a good thing for Indonesia. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and talk to us. I mean, you mentioned a little bit about uh, the eight unicorns, and I know that you work very closely with a lot of the startups in Indonesia by everything that you do. Uh, looking at the eight unicorns now, what do you think what contributed to their success? You know, what was it about? You know, was it a business model? Was it the way they were aggressive in initial expansion? What, what are the success factors here to become, you know, what's the secret sauce to become a unicorn in Indonesia? <laughs> Most of the unicorns actually started quite early. Tokopedia, Tokopedia started like, I remember they got an award from the Bubu Awards with, you know, I we gave out Bubu Awards <laughs> every two years. Mm -hmm. And um, Tokopedia got an award when, you know, it was just a website. But we, we saw something in the founders um, that was in 2013. So mm -hmm. um, that was quite early. Um, there, were, there were not many uh, e-commerce players yet. So same thing happened with Gojek. Gojek also started like 2012, I think. It's quite early yeah. as well. So it's also the, the, the founders. The founders are, are quite hustlers. <laughs> they believe in what they built. Mm -hmm. and, and at the end of the day, um, they were able to be connected to the right investors as well. And I think that was also part of the uh, success factor is they, they were able to get angels. They were able to get venture capital later on and actually execute and believe in what they dream. So I think that's, that's partly why they become so successful. Yeah. So if you can give some examples, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a fan of Nadim, of course, and, and yeah. he speaks about how he actually started talking to the Ojeks, right? The motorcycle yeah. uh, taxis and realized, oh, all these people are uh, idle for majority of the time. And there is much it everywhere, uh, you know, traffic jam everywhere in Indonesia. So there's definitely a disconnect here that he can solve. So when you, you're talking about execution here, can you give us some examples of, you know, some of the founders that you've worked with just to, you know, help the founders who are building? How did they think about execution? Was it, you know, creating small pilots? Was it uh, linking up partnerships from the very beginning? How, how did they build? Day one, um, you know, I always tell them start monetizing from day one is impossible. Because I think if you don't monetize from day one, then you, you won't get people to, to believe in you, right? When you talk to mm. investors, you don't, you don't have a good business model. So um, the way I see it, all these startups, they actually try their best to actually find the best business model for their, for their startups or their companies. And they do start as a pilot project, a smaller project, of course, to make sure that uh, they, they can get people to actually use their product or their applications. And, mm -hmm. you know, after that, you just have to, to execute and start building and start believing and also make sure that, um, you know, you, you have the right, the right uh, ingredient to go, mar to go to the right market and make sure people believe also in what you're building. And solving the problem is like really, really important because Indonesia has a lot to solve and mm -hmm. finding that simple problem. But actually, you know, like those, those Gojek, you know, the, the hailing ride, the motorcycle uh, drivers who just stand in one place, they don't know how to connect to their users. A very simple problem, but it ended up to be like, you know, one of the best solution that you can give. Yeah, Gojek is probably uh, one of the most famous one here in the country. Yeah. Yeah. So it's finding, I, I, I like the concept of monetizing first, you know, get, a, get your first paid customer, right? You know, proof. Yes. And, and that's proof proving your value proposition that you have yes. somebody who's will, who wants this, there's a demand and willing to pay for it. So that's important. And then yes. executing and, and not, not uh, discounting the complexity of uh, yes. or simplicity of a problem. 
uh, yeah. as what Nadine did. So as you're looking at, you know, some of the challenges now in Indonesia, I, I think you you touched upon this, you know, people don't realize in, in Southeast Asia, we have um, the issue of the fact that we're a little fragmented, right? We have 17,000 islands. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of news about startups rising from Jakarta. But what about the underserved markets and the, you know, uh, the non-top tier cities, as we call it, are, are you also seeing um, the startup uh, energy across uh, the different islands? What, what are you seeing there? When you talk about other cities outside of Jakarta, we talk about uh, Bandung because Bandung is about two hours away from Jakarta by car. And they have like the best universities there as well. So we see a lot of startups coming out from Bandung and there's Jogjakarta, there's Surabaya. And, you know, the way I see it, most of the time, the startups that are outside of Jakarta, they're more, um, how do you call it? Resilient because um, they, didn't, they don't have um, the same amount of network that you can get in Jakarta. So they just have to hustle and make sure they survive. So at the end of the day, a lot of the companies that are outside of Jakarta, they already make money like earlier than startups who are in Jakarta. Tell you the truth, right. that's, that's hmm. why um, also like in Startup Indonesia, we're able to get like 50% of the startups that are being curated to meet the uh, venture capitals are from outside from Jakarta. So that's how I see it. Like, because, you know, they probably struggle more because they don't have yeah, the same yeah. access to meet venture capitals or to meet mentors or to meet um, angel investors. So they struggle more and they hustle more. And at the end of the day, they have to monetize from as soon as possible because they don't have that much money to burn, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they don't have that luxury. And, and I love to hear, you know, what, what are some of the most uh, unique or exciting ideas that, that you're coming across? And, 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 you know, this is an opportunity to, uh, you know, plug them as well. Because, I, I mean, one of the bad uh, things that, that's being said sometimes about Asia is that, hey, it's all copycat models, right? There's nothing original here. This ride-hailing concept, Uber created it. Uh, Lazada, Zalora, you know, everything that Rocket Internet had created is all copycats. That was their model. Is there anything original in Indonesia that we can look forward to? There's a few things that we, we probably created because we understand about the local market because it's mm -hmm. probably different from uh, what other countries need. Uh, there's this, this uh, girl, she actually created an app called Jahit or Sewing. Sewing, yep. Yeah. So, because she knows a lot of poor, like, all over in the seamstresses, sorry, yeah. They um they're mostly like 90% women, mm. but um it's hard for them to get job because they don't know how to market themselves, right? So yeah. she created this platform where all the seamstresses can go into the platform and she also created a marketplace what what things that they can get the job, you know, like they can find jobs, you know, for seamstresses. So she's, she's bridging between the seamstresses and all the jobs that are needed for them. Like, for instance, like working for a fashion designer, um, try to create a marketplace for the, the materials. So it has all that. And we just, I haven't really seen it done in other countries yet. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not easy, but I know she's she's trying hard to create this platform, which is quite yeah, interesting. I love it. Yeah, no, and, and I think that's true. You know, while there are, of course, models that, that are copied, there's certain things that are so unique uh, mm -hmm. to Asia. I mean, even Bukalapa, right? I mean, this yeah. this concept of small stores everywhere, that, that's only in in parts of Southeast wow. Asia um, that, that makes it interesting. Good. So so now as you're looking out, uh, Bubu, the next 20 years, Indonesia, the next 20 years, uh, what do you think are going to be some of the challenges that we need to address um, as we're thinking about expansion here? Yeah, I think until today, our challenge as is the human resource, is the, the mm. especially the programmers and the developers. I think we're so lacking um, because, you know, uh, STEM, which is engineering, is not really big here in Indonesia. We really need engineers. We really mm. need high-skilled developers and programmers because if we don't have that, I don't know how we can grow all this company. 20 years, I also want to see 
probably more women become leaders and entrepreneurs. Um, I think that's that's one of the reason uh, we started Super Girls in Tech as well, which you are actually mm. supporting. <laughs> And so, yeah, um, hopefully in 20 years, uh, we can go past all these challenges, but that's probably one of the biggest thing that we have to solve is the human resource. So now, um, you know, talking about uh, growth and, and what you're looking forward to, we, we turn to the final section of uh, today's session, which is billion dollar questions. So eight quick questions, uh, quick responses on, on what first comes to mind. Uh, okay. Shinzo, are you ready? Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get started. Uh, what's your highest high, Shinta? My highest high, you know, is now. I mean, like, I think I always believe in present time. So mm. everything that where you are right now, that's your, you should be, that's your highest high. It should be your oh, highest. I like that. And, and very original. And I'm honored to be your highest high at this moment. Yes. Lowest low. <laughs> what's what's your lowest low? I, I don't have because I have this this uh, view of whatever is going on with you is actually is going to be the best of things that will happen to you. So I always try mm. to see a positive thing, even though at that moment you think that's your lowest low, but at the end of the day, that, that is the best thing that will happen to you. Mm. So, so then that brings me to the, 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 yeah, I like that. So this brings me to the next question. What's the best mistake or failure that you've made? Failure? Yes. Mm -hmm. hey, my, my failure is my asset right now. So like the best mistake is like, you know, I started early. <laughs> mm. Yeah, because I started early. I've made all this mistake this 20 years. And, you know, um, that mistake actually brought me to who I am right now. Um, you know, I think with all those experience that I've, I've gone through, I'm able to help mentor others as well. Yeah. Okay. If you think about someone who's successful, who do you yeah. think of and why? All the time. I always think of Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and I was like, um, I know she's a billionaire, but I think, I think that that is not the reason. I think one of the reason is because um, she taught me about self-awareness. I know your purpose in life. I think that's what she taught me. And because if you know your purpose in life, life, and then you know you're passionate about it, then you're happy about it. So you need to be happy. I think that's that's really important. And I see that with her because she's creating impact. Um, you know, um, she's teaching people to be of service to others. I think that's that's really beautiful, and, and I think that's being successful. Yeah, yeah, love it. Common misconceptions about Shinta. I'm actually an introvert. I'm really, ah! <laughs> I'm really not good in speaking to the public. Um, you know, early on, it was so hard for me to, to do a presentation, to actually do a public speaking and all that. It's like, for me, it's, it's super hard. So I have to fake it. Mm. <laughs> it takes time. Mm. Uh, but you know that's I'm I'm very shy actually. So sometimes I'm so quiet when I'm around people that I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's not yeah. because I'm snobbish. It's because I'm just like not comfortable and I'm actually an introvert. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, I think uh, that's a, a good advice there because you definitely have faked it in in a lot of situations that I've seen you shine. So. <laughs> fret not to the introverts and you know some of the best and uh best entrepreneurs are actually introverts so yeah. different versions of leader and now talking about uh leader leadership and the kind of leader that you are being an introvert but beyond that what is your hardest lesson that you've had to learn as a leader i think uh the hardest lesson is actually to to communicate properly to your team or, you know, to communicate your mission and vision. Um, because yeah, partly I'm an introvert. That's why it's sometimes mm. hard for me to communicate it. So now I learn because if I don't communicate, people don't understand what, what is in my head, sometimes always in my head. And, you know, I get frustrated, like why people don't understand what I'm saying. It's because it's- Why don't you get me? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's in my head. Like, so, okay, now, so I have to learn to actually talk to my team sometimes I have to do it even one-on-one -on -one because mm. I think that's, that's part of my 
you know, this, this, this part of me that is not really good, like talking about mm. things or communicating things properly. Mm. So yeah, I'm learning a lot on that. Yeah. Yeah. Worst advice you've been given or that you've heard people give? Um, well, we came from the Asian culture. Um, this, is, this is actually one advice from my other grandmother. I remember she said, you don't have to take master degrees and everything because you won't get a husband. Because, <laughs> mm. you know, boys are scared when you're too smart and everything else. So I remember that, but the funny thing is, she was the one who actually worked for the family. So I don't mm. know why she said that to me, but you know, at the end of the day, um, of course, I always believe that you know, just you know, do what you think is right for yourself, and as long as you know, it's good for others as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I can definitely resonate with that. I've heard that you know, when you're too yeah. successful, you're intimidating, and no one wants to marry you. But um, I'm glad we both proved them wrong, right? <laughs> exactly. And finally, most worthwhile investment that you've made in the last couple of years? I think I have to say it's startupindonesia.com mm. because I think um, I wanted to actually help include all startups all over Indonesia to give equal access to all of them. Um, and actually we we kind of did it you know um we we are helping a lot of startups outside of jakarta and we're able to give equal access to everybody to talk to the mentors that you probably wouldn't think you can be able to reach or you can talk to all the venture capitals you know all the those big names venture capital and mm. this this is um, really good if we can give that opportunity to everyone because you know sometimes we don't see the startup because they're out of reach or they don't know how to reach the the investors yeah. so I think that's yeah that's probably one of probably the best investment at the moment. congratulations and with that you know that's been a fantastic uh one hour power hour with you to talk a little bit about everything you're working on and uh challenging you to, to push you to, to give me some insight into what's happening in indonesia so hopefully this was uh you know helpful for the investors and everyone that's tuning in but thanks so much Shinta, and thank you for your leadership and i look forward to uh supporting you in super goals and tech very soon and and what whatever else we're, we're working on together Yes, thank you so much, Sarah. It's been an honor to be here.